This morning we continue our series beyond 2020 vision, seeking to see beyond the mess that we're in. That is our goal. And so as we go to God's word today, let's just pray one more time and ask that God's spirit will speak to us through his word, verses that are highly debated and can be highly misunderstood, and we want to be humble in our understandings, but firm in our application, thankful that God is in control, that Christ is upon the throne. So let's bow our heads in prayer. Gracious Father, as you answered Daniel's prayer, as you sent to him angels in swift flight to explain to him the future, I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit will help us illumine our hearts, enlighten our minds, to understand your word to us today. And not only to understand it, but to apply it to our lives, to help us see ourselves in your word and the changes that you would make to our understanding, to our believing, to our living. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So our goal is 2020 vision. Seeing beyond 2020, this year is quite a mess. How do we see beyond the mess that we're in? Well, I know how I see beyond the mess that we're in, and it starts here in this book. This book is God's Word. Amen? Amen. 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 And faith comes by hearing this Word. It gives the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not Seen. And so to increase our faith, to grow in our faith, we must come back time and time again to this book. I was sharing with a group of pastors earlier in the week that throughout this 2020 difficult year, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, and especially early on in the lockdowns, my best days have always started with a better word. My best days have always started when I began my day in this book. My not-so-great days and even some of my worst days were where I began with the news <laughs> and focusing on the words of people. But when I come to God's Word, when I saturate in this book, when I allow Him to speak to me and pray through the Scriptures, those are good days. And better days begin with a better word. So as we come to God's Word today, we're reminded that God's Word helps us and presents us and gives us a bigger perspective of the future. God's Word gives us a bigger perspective of the future. It keeps us grounded in God's promises and focused on His purposes. And this is especially true when it comes to biblical prophecy, like what we read about in Daniel chapter 9. In revealing God's purpose and plan for our future, it reminds us that God is in control of our present. This year, 2020, with all the surprises it held in store for us, did not catch God by surprise. He knows what he's doing. His story, God's story, marches on. So last week we examined together Daniel's prayer in the first half of Daniel 9. And you'll remember that Daniel's prayer was biblical, humble, personal. It was a good model and is a good model to follow. I was so encouraged this week when someone was sharing that she used the Daniel prayer in Daniel 9 as a guide for her own prayer and her own devotion time with the Lord. And if you have not yet done so, I would encourage you to use that prayer in Daniel 9, 4 through 19 as a guide for your own prayers, repenting of sin, confessing sin, turning from sin, praying for our nation, praying for our city, asking God to be merciful and gracious and to act upon our behalf. These are all the prayers uh, that we can pray as we follow the Daniel 9 example prayer. Arising out of his study of God's word through the prophet Jeremiah, Daniel determined that 70 years of captivity were nearly complete. 
Daniel had lived through them all. From the very first deportation to Babylon, Daniel had lived through all 70 years of Babylonian captivity. So he humbled himself before the Lord, confessing sin, crying out to the Lord to restore his people for the glory of the Lord's name. That was Daniel's great passion, the glory and renown of the Lord's name. So as a model of prayer, Daniel begins with adoration and worship for God, who he is and what he has done. He continues confession, honestly assessing sin, acknowledging that God's judgments are just. He concludes with a humble presentation of his case, seeking God's glory, requesting his mercy. And I believe this is the kind of prayer that heaven hears. And I know I'm right in that belief, because indeed what we see in chapter 9, verse 20 is that Daniel's prayer sends angels into swift flight from the very moment that he begins praying. God is pleased to answer our prayers. One biblical scholar said in response to Daniel chapter 9 that God takes more pleasure in answering our prayers than we even do in his answers. He is our Father in heaven who desires to hear us pray and who is pleased and glorified to answer according to his will. So Daniel 9 and verse 20, let's take a look as we read more about the big picture. First of all, verses 20 through 23. While I was speaking and praying, this is Daniel writing in the Hebrew language, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the holy hill of my God, that is Jerusalem, Mount Zion, while I was speaking in prayer, the man, Gabriel, now that doesn't mean that he's not an angel, but it means that he, as an angel, has human form and characteristics to him. The man, Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the first, came to me to, in swift flight. I don't know if that means that Gabriel had wings or if that's kind of how Daniel pictured Gabriel as he came. But it was at the time of the evening sacrifice, so between 3 and 4 p.m. It's interesting that Daniel mentions the evening sacrifice because he's in Babylon. And during those 70 years of captivity in Babylon, are the exiles like Daniel offering sacrifices there? No, we're not. But so ingrained in his mind, even from the age of 15 when he was deported, the sacrifices that God had commanded and that God desired that every day at 3 p.m., I bet he spent extra time in prayer and seeking the Lord in devotion as his sacrifice of praise. Even though he was not able to offer the sacrifice in the temple as God has called his people to do, he still noted 3 to 4 p.m. as the hour of the evening sacrifice. <sighs> By the way, what time did Jesus breathe his last upon the cross? Debbie, what time was that? 3 p.m. Coincidence? <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. Jesus, our Passover lamb, was sacrificed for our sins. Verse 22, he made me understand. Gabriel made Daniel understand, speaking with me and saying, O oh, Daniel, I have now come out to give you insight and understanding. So insight and understanding are a gift from the Lord. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved cherished, treasured, prized. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. So we see here, because we are greatly loved by God, along with Daniel, he gives wisdom and understanding through his word. Wisdom and understanding are gifts of God's grace to us that we receive through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The ministry of the Holy Spirit through the inspired word, the ministry of the Holy Spirit to our hearts, speaking to us and speaking through other people to us. However, these are gifts of God's grace, but we must also give his word careful consideration. Look at what it says. I want to point this out in verse 22. I've come to give you insight and understanding. And then in verse 23, consider the word and understand the vision. We can only consider and understand by God's grace and enabling. But we also are commanded to meditate, to consider, and to think carefully. I call this faith-seeking understanding. Say that with me. Faith-seeking understanding. 
faith seeking understanding. And so we have a caveat here as we get into Daniel 9, 24 through 27. Part of giving God's word careful consideration involves admitting that we don't understand everything. I listened, I've heard several sermons, quite a few throughout my lifetime on these verses, and generally given from the faith tradition in which I grew up, which is a dispensational in times perspective, and very confident in exact dates and working everything out, and today I'm going to present that basic perspective to you as we go. But I do believe it's careful when we come to a passage like this to admit that we don't understand everything. As we look at Daniel 9, 24 through 27, we should admit that there are multiple ways that good and godly people have understood these words through the last 2,000 years, through the centuries of the Church of Jesus Christ. To avoid confusion, I'm not going to give you all the alternate viewpoints, because that would become more like a class and the person who yawned earlier will yawn even louder. So we don't, <laughs> we, don't, we don't want that. But you should know that alternate opinions exist. And any serious study of the text should carefully consider them. If you'd like more information about some of the alternative opinions and considerations, you can ask me. A good study Bible, like the ESV study Bible, lays out three or four different perspectives on these verses and can help you see that uh, while the perspective I'm sharing with you, I believe is pretty clear and compelling, there are other perspectives on these verses as well. So that's our caveat as we get into verses 24 through 27. I also want you to be encouraged today as we study. Be encouraged today. Be reminded that God is in control and that he is always at work. His story is unfolding according to his perfect Plan. His story, history, is unfolded according to God's perfect plan. In the Moody Bible commentary, Michael Redownick helps us see the big picture of this chapter for our lives today. And I want to share with you his words. So raise really quick, those of you in the sanctuary, raise your right hand if you're still awake. Yes. Okay. All right. All right. I've got one person sleeping, but otherwise we're all still okay. awake. That's okay when you take our one bus ride. It's all right. I get it. Okay. Those of you who are on Zoom, if I can see you, wave at me if you're still with me. Okay. I see a couple of you waving at me. All right. Just want to make sure everybody's still there. In the Moody Bible commentary, Michael Redownick helps us see the big picture. He says, quote, Daniel's concern the outset of the chapter was God's restoration of the people of Israel to the land of Israel after 70 years of captivity. But God's concern was not with the past or present, but with the future. Therefore, he sent an angel with a message about his prophetic program for Israel, including the Messiah's advent, death, return, and restoration of Israel. Much like Daniel, followers of Messiah can become frustrated at the decay desecration, and corruption of contemporary society, and long for God to take action immediately. How many of you can relate to that statement? We get frustrated by the desecration, the decay, the disobedience, the rebellion all around us. I see Debbie's hand raised there nice and tall. Yes, we get frustrated by that, and we long for God to take action now. We want God to fix this now. How long, O oh Lord, how long? And God's people have been saying that since the time of the psalmist in the Hebrew scriptures. How long, O oh Lord? Nevertheless, Michael Redellant concludes, those who have trusted in Jesus can be encouraged that God has the big picture in view and that he will certainly fulfill his prophetic calendar and establish his kingdom upon the earth. So God is in control and he is fulfilling his will for the big picture that is before us. And so, because we're living our lives today, because we're so involved in what's happening in our personal lives, so involved in what's happening in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our city, with the current election climate, with everything happening in America and the world with COVID-19 in the year 2020, we have to be able to take a step back and see the big picture. That's what the eyes of faith enable us to do. And how do we build our faith? By going to the scriptures. So that's why prophecies like Daniel 9, 24 through 27 are so important for us 
to help us get the big picture. So let's take a look now at these verses. First of all, verse 24, we're introduced here to 70 weeks. It says, 70 weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint a most holy place. God bless you. That's the cutest sneeze I've ever heard. <laughs> that is like only a little mouse just sneezed. I was looking. <laughs> All right, 70 weeks. By the way, we were discussing earlier that sneezing apparently is not a symptom of coronavirus. So there you tell everybody that next time they get, they get worded out. Yes, I worry. <laughs> All right, what are these 70 weeks that we read about here? Uh, we should know if we go back to a place like Leviticus 25 and verse 8, the mention of the year of Jubilee, that uh, seven sevens. Uh, and then the year of Jubilee being the 50th year there in Leviticus 25, that these 70 weeks are actually, the Hebrew word for week is 77s. And so we're talking about a grouping of seven years. One week in this reckoning is seven years. And so 70 weeks would be seven times 70. Who's got their math brain on, calculator in their mind? What's seven times 70? 190. 490, very, very good, 490 years. So when we talk about 70 weeks being decreed, we're talking about 490 years. And the next question is, are these literal years or symbolic? There are good and godly Christian people who believe this is a symbolic reference. We believe, I believe, that this is a literal reference, as with the 70-year captivity, which was literal in chapter 9 and verse 2. So the 70 weeks here, I believe, refers to a literal period of time. So let's ask, before we talk about how to know when the 70 weeks begin, or what years that may be talking about, how will we know when the 70 years ends? And the reason why we start out with that question is... Because that's where the text starts out. Verse 24 gives us the terminus. It gives us the conclusion of how we'll recognize when these 70 weeks have come to a pass. So remember, the 70 weeks refer to a literal period of time. One week, seven years. Seven <coughs> weeks, how many years? 490 years. So that's what we're talking about. How will we know when the 70 weeks are over? At the completion of the 70 weeks, the 490 years, we will have six things, and they can be grouped in two broad categories. First category, the removal of sin. Second category, the restoration of righteousness. If you're taking notes in your bulletin, uh, the, the tab's going to work quite right, so you'll see point two there is kind of on the right margin. The removal of sin and the restoration of righteousness. So first of all, the removal of sin. It says in verse 24, 70 weeks about your people, your holy city, Jerusalem, to finish the transgression. Finish the transgression. Hebrew Peshaw. Transgression is a line that God has drawn in the sand, and you look God in the eye and you step over it. I believe this is referring to the time of uh, around the second coming, depending on how you figure out the timing of uh rapture and tribulation and second coming and the millennial reign and all of that, but this is when the finishing of transgression will be accomplished. Second, it says put an end to sin. Sin is a little different than transgression. It's not really looking at a line that God has drawn in the sin and stepping over it. Sin is a missing of the mark. These are sins of omission and commission. Sins that we do without even knowing it. And good things that we omit and don't do perhaps not even aware that we've neglected the thing that God has commanded us to do. So finishing transgression, putting an end to sin again, that won't be until Jesus establishes his kingdom finally upon the earth, that we will have an end to sin once and for all. That's what we look forward to in glorification. It's been said that salvation involves a past, a present, and a future, and it's correct. The past tense of our salvation, God's work for us through Jesus Christ, is called justification. Justification. I have, by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ, 
been delivered from the penalty of sin to the position of righteousness before God. The present tense of God's gracious salvation is called what? Sanctification. Say that with me. Sanctification. Sanctification is God's ongoing work through the Holy Spirit to deliver me from the practice of sin to the power, from the power of sin to the practice of righteousness. God is delivering me from the power of sin to the practice of righteousness. The third future tense of God's salvation is called glorification. Say that. Glorification. So we got justification, past tense, sanctification, present tense, glorification, future tense. That is when we are once and for all delivered from the very presence of sin altogether to the perfection of righteousness. Not just me, but you. Everybody having their perfect, most wonderful, amazing, righteous day every single day together for all eternity. Those who are hidden in Christ, those who are covered by the blood of the Lamb. That's what we have to look forward to. These things will take place in the time of that glorification. A third thing is mentioned here in this 70 weeks, atonement for iniquity. So we have all three Hebrew words for sin that are mentioned, transgression, sin, and iniquity. Atonement for iniquity. Where does this take place? Where does the once for all final sacrifice, final covering of sin take place? Debbie? When Jesus went to the cross. When Jesus went to the cross. When Jesus dies on the cross for our sins. He says, it is finished. And so this is an aspect of Daniel's prophecy that we look back upon as being complete. His work complete, Jesus sits down at the right hand of the throne of God in heaven, and he said, it is finished, paid in full. So there are aspects of this vision, like all Bible prophecy, that while future to Daniel are past to us, and there are aspects of this prophecy that were future to Daniel and remain future to us today. The second part of these six things that we look forward to at the conclusion of the 70 weeks would be not only the removal of sin, but the restoration of righteousness. The restoration of righteousness. First of all, a righteous society. I believe this is looking forward to the millennium. It says to bring in everlasting righteousness. This is a righteous kingdom. This is why people are upset today. It doesn't matter if you're a left-leaning liberal or a right-leaning conservative or someone who claims to be in the middle as an independent. We're all unhappy with the state of affairs in the United States of America. And then when you travel to other countries, they're unhappy as well. Even the people in power who have more influence to make a difference, they're not happy with how things are because this world is not the way it's supposed to be. And so we long for that righteous society, that millennial kingdom, sometimes described in secular philosophy as a utopian idea, but this is when Jesus reigns upon the earth as described for us in the final chapters of the book of Revelation. Also, a final fulfillment. Final fulfillment, it says, to seal both vision and and prophet. I believe that's talking there about the sealing, the authorizing. We know in Revelation that it's Jesus who, who unseals the scrolls to enact God's plan for the end of time. And this, I believe, is the fulfillment of the visions and all the prophecies. This will take place ultimately again at the reign of Christ. And finally, it says to anoint a most holy place. Now, there are some who believe the most holy place is a reference to Jesus. But I believe that it's more natural to understand it as a reference to the new temple. And perhaps the temple that's described for us in Ezekiel chapter 40 and following, the new temple and the millennium. So that's what we have to look forward to. That's how we'll know that the 70 weeks have concluded. How will we know when the 70 weeks have begun? How will we know when they started? Verse 25 tells us that. Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, that word there is Messiah, 
It can refer to Jesus Christ, but it can also refer to other people who are anointed. So context helps us decide. From the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince or ruler, there shall be seven weeks. Then for 62 weeks it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. So what's seven times seven? 49. All right, so 49 years, seven weeks. And, oh, tough question. How about 62 weeks? How many years is that? 62 weeks. I got I to look at my notes for a second here. So, um, 62 weeks is how many years? A year and 10 days. <laughs> All right, seven plus 62 is 69. That's 483. Yeah. Jesus' baptism and inauguration uh, his three-year-old ministry, that's what I believe we're talking about there. But let's get into this a little bit more, okay? How will we know when the seven weeks have begun? First of all, you have this decree going out to restore and build Jerusalem. When did that take place? There's a few different options. Some people think it's Cyrus's decree allowing the captives to return to Jerusalem. Some think it's Artaxerxes' first decree in 457 BC. And so that's one that many good and godly evangelical Bible-believing Christians would go for. That would mean if 457 BC, Ezra chapter 7, Artaxerxes' first decree, which is focused on the rebuilding of the temple and not so much the rebuilding of the city, however. But if that's the case, then 69 weeks, 7 plus 62 equals 483 years. If you do the math from then until the first century, you would go 483 years to the time of Jesus' baptism and the beginning of this three-year public ministry. So that could fit to an exact year from the time that our Xerxes makes his first decree. I'm going to go along with a third option, Artaxerxes' second decree in 444 B.C., authorizing Nehemiah to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Because that's specifically what Daniel says. The going out of the word to restore and build not just the temple, but Jerusalem as a city. And if that's the case, it would go from 444 B.C., authorizing Nehemiah to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, you trace out the years, some have done so even to the exact day, to the triumphal entry of Jesus in Jerusalem. So again, this is complicated. I'm not losing you, I hope. But I want you to see how exact and precise the prophecy is. So if you're in the sanctuary, this time, I want you to raise your left hand and show me that you're still listening and doing your very best to follow along. All right. And if you're watching on Zoom, I want you to wave your right hand at me like that. Okay, I see I see at least, I see two people on there waving. Thank you very much. And everybody else I'm sure is waving even though I can't see them. All right. So Michael Rodelnik again gives us a good summary here and I want you to follow along. He says, quote, the calculation is as follows. There will be a period of seven weeks of years, that's 49 years, followed by 62 weeks of years, that's 434 years, making a total of 69 weeks of years, or 483 years, from the decree until the coming of the Messiah, the Prince. The seven-week period, 49 years, most likely pertains to the time it actually took from the issuing of the decree by Artaxerxes until the restoration of the walls of Jerusalem. The total of 483 years, or 69 weeks, should be calculated as specific biblical prophetic years of 360 days each. So the time doesn't work out quite right if they're 365 and a quarter days, but if you use 360 days for a year based on 12 lunar months of 30 days each, the starting point of the prophecy would have begun on March 5th, 444 B.C., followed by 69 weeks of 360-day years. Okay, so follow me here. Which equals 173,880 days. 
So if you trace from the decree to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, March 5, 444 B.C., if you trace that exactly 173,880 days, guess what day you get? March 30, A.D. 33. March 30, A.D. 33. What many believe to be the date of Jesus the Messiah's triumphal entry into Jerusalem and his cleansing of the temple. Isn't that incredible? That's absolutely incredible. Yes. Now, we have to be humble in our assertions here. There are other viewpoints. But I think this is a very good perspective. And as a good friend of Montrose, the pastor over at Cornelia Baptist Church, likes to say, biblical prophecy is written such that we don't always know what's going to happen, but when it does happen, we know that God told us it would. Yeah. And I think this is one of those cases. As we look back at the text of Daniel and we trace out those days to the exact date, the date of Jesus the Messiah's triumphal entry into Jerusalem, his cleansing of the temple, we see that with precise detail, God announced ahead of time what was going to happen. Isn't that amazing? Yes. It's absolutely, whether you agree with that perspective 100% or not, it's absolutely incredible that God had purpose and planned this from the very beginning. Incredible to me how God did this. All right, verse 26, we have the events following the 69 weeks. It says, after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. So we have the seven weeks, remember, between the decree and the rebuilding, the finishing of Jerusalem. And then we have 62 weeks after that for a total of 69. An anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. This is speaking of the anointed one, the servant of the Lord from Isaiah 53. It's talking about Jesus being cut off, I believe. So the Messiah is cut off circa A.D. 33. I love how the Jews for Jesus newsletter reads. Anybody receive the Jews for Jesus newsletter? It says at the top, founded A.D. 33, give or take a year or two. <laughs> so we have to be a little bit humble as we talk about all of the dates that we mentioned. But the Messiah, Jesus Yeshua, is cut off. He is crucified in A.D. 33. Of course, we know that he who is crucified is buried. And he rose again, conquering the grave. He appears to his disciples. He ascends to heaven. The Holy Spirit is given. The Holy Spirit is given and poured out upon Jew and Gentile alike, all who by grace through faith trust in Jesus, turning from their sins and trusting in Jesus, unified together in the church of Jesus Christ. So the Messiah is cut off A.D. 33. The destruction of Jerusalem happens... In A.D. 70, it says, After the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. The people of the prince who is to come. Now, who is this prince who is to come? Some identify this prince with Jesus, the Messiah. And if you do that, that changes the way that you understand the entirety of verses 26 and 27. Some people understand it as Antiochus Epiphanes IV. Some people understand it as a reference to Titus, the Roman general who destroyed Jerusalem, and others understand it as a reference to Antichrist. I would see it as a reference to Antichrist with earlier characters in history like Antiochus Epiphanes and Titus and Nero and even Hitler recently being uh, types, if you will, uh, foreshadows of the Antichrist who is still yet to come. All right, so the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city. So that seems to be pretty clearly talking in history, at least, about the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70 and the sanctuary, the destruction of the temple. Its end shall come of the flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. Desolations are decreed. And just another note from uh, Michael Redellin, which I think is helpful. The prince who is to come is distinct from Messiah the prince, but instead is a reference to the future ruler described as a little horn in Daniel 7. 
also known as the beast or antichrist. He himself will not be the one who destroys Jerusalem and the temple, but rather it is his people who will do it. Since previously Daniel, viewing this ruler as coming from the fourth major world power, which world power was that? Not Greece, but Rome, coming from Rome, this prophecy predicts that Romans would destroy Jerusalem, which they did under Titus, the general, in A.D. 70. So you have Messiah cut off, you have the destruction of Jerusalem, A.D. 70, and then you have a very significant time gap between the 69th week and the 70th week that is described for us here. That very significant time gap, many would point to as what the Apostle Paul speaks of as uh, the mystery of Jews and Gentiles included within the people of God, something that the Jewish prophets did not see coming. It's a mystery that God revealed in the last days. It's what some call the church age, the time of the Gentiles. It's the age in which we're living right now. It's as if between the 69th week and the 70th week, which is the great tribulation yet to come, that in a sense there's been a, a pause button pressed for the church to do the Lord Jesus Christ's work in the world. I'm reminded of 2 Peter chapter 3. People will say, scoffing, where is this coming that he has promised? All things continue. But they deliberately overlook the fact that with the Lord, a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. And then it says, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise of some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so this is the age of the church and the great commission of Jesus Christ empowered in their witness by the Holy Spirit himself to accomplish the work of spreading the good news of the kingdom of Jesus Christ in calling people to turn from their sin and to trust in Jesus and to be saved. It's the time of God's patience, not wanting any to perish, but wanting all to come to repentance. And so we would see this as, in a sense, the church age, an unreckoned amount of time, a gap between the 69th week and the 70th week, which is yet to come. Okay, so here's a picture. I can't even read it from where I'm standing. Maybe you can read it. I'm not sure. But it describes for us what this most amazing prophecy is all about. And it's in your bulletin. You can take a close look at it there, and maybe that will be helpful to you. But just really quick to summarize what you're seeing in the photo, in the picture, you've got the 70 weeks, the 490 years. The first seven weeks, or 49 years, from 444, around about decree to rebuild Jerusalem, to the time that Jerusalem is restored. And then 62 weeks from then until the time of the triumphal entry of Jesus. Then you have the Messiah cut off, crucified at the cross, providing atonement for our sins. Then you have the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. And then you have an unreckoned amount of time called the church age, in which we, as a church, Jews and Gentiles, together, united in the name of Jesus, are seeking to win the lost to Jesus Christ. A time of God's patience. The gospel will go out into all the world, to all creation, to every creature, and then the end will come. Most agree with myself that not only is every single sunrise one day closer, but we can look at the signs of the time and see that we are getting closer and closer and closer each and every day. And each and every generation of Christians has been prepared for the day to come, and we must remain vigilant and prepared as Christ commands us to do. For this final week, the 70th week, verse 27, he, again speaking, I believe of the Antichrist, shall make a strong covenant with many for one week, and for half of the week he shall put it into sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is torn out on the desolator. 
Now, there are some who believe this is talking about Antiochus Epiphanes, but remember, when Jesus talks about this in Matthew 24, he's still speaking of it as something yet to happen in the future. So while Antiochus Epiphanes in 167 uh, B.C. may indeed be a type of the Antichrist, he himself is not the Antichrist. Some also think, just to give an alternative opinion, that putting an end to sacrifice an offering is still talking about the ministry of Jesus, who by his final offering upon the cross brought about the end of the sacrificial system. However, Christ will certainly not commit the abomination of desolation, and so therefore I would disagree with their opinion. So he, in verse 27, is a reference to the Antichrist, a.k.a. the beast, a.k.a. the lawless one, who will desecrate the future temple and cause worship there to cease. The seven-year period is describing Jacob's trouble, the coming great tribulation. After three and a half years of the midway mark in the middle of this week, this seven-year period, the Antichrist will break his covenant with Israel, whatever that may look like, and unleash unprecedented attacks against the Jewish people as well as followers of of Jesus. You can read about this in Matthew 24, verse 21, as well as Revelation 7, 14. The Antichrist will desecrate the temple by declaring himself to be God. Jesus views this as a yet future temple, not the one that Antiochus defiled in 167 BC, and not the temple that Titus destroyed in AD 70. So as this Antichrist is very fearful, as he is going to come against the Jewish people and also against followers of Jesus during this great tribulation, we should be aware, whether or not we're in agreement that Christians will go through the tribulation or that God will take us out of it, we should be aware that the end of this beast, this Antichrist, is sure. Revelation 20, verse 20 says, The beast was captured with it, the false prophet who is in its presence, who had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast, those who worshipped this image, these two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. So this Antichrist, this beast who is to come, will be taken out. As it says, until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. The decreed end of God is the lake of fire for this desolator that causes these abominations. So we have Daniel's 70th week. Again, there's a picture on the screen that shows you how this week, this seven-year period, is to be divided. One week equals seven years. First of all, there's a covenant, a peace treaty made with Israel to begin this seven-year period. In the midst of the week, at the midway mark, three and a half years, the covenant is broken. The abomination of desolation is set up. And at the end of this great tribulation, after the tribulation of those days, Christ the Messiah will return. So that, brothers and sisters, is an explanation humbly given of Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, and the 70 weeks. I want to encourage you once again, as we study biblical prophecy, the point of it is to let us know what's going to happen, to prepare us, so that when the future does take place, God's people will say, yes, this indeed is what has been fulfilled amongst us, and it is wonderful, and it is glorious. But also for us today, as we look forward to what God is going to do, we ought to be encouraged, because God is in control. Amen. He is always at work. The scripture says that Antichrist is coming, and indeed is already in the world Today And we know that there are many more and more vocal, even in the United States, even in a land that was founded to be a city on a hill, more and more vocal and opposed to Christians and the, the Christian message and Christianity. But we know that God is in control. His story is unfolding according to his perfect plan. Amen? Amen. And so as we see that perhaps even to the exact Day, from the decree to rebuild Jerusalem to the day that Jesus triumphantly enters Jerusalem and purifies the temple to the exact day God's prophecy is fulfilled. That reminds us 
that there is a day written in God's book for each and every one of us. Either that's the day that he calls us home, or that's the day that he returns for us. We know that day is coming. And so we can maintain hope. We can, by God's grace, persevere as we come to this book, as we build our faith, as we keep hope alive. Amen? Amen. 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 Gracious Father in heaven, thank you for your word to us today. We pray, God, that in humility we are correctly understanding what is written here. But most of all, God, we can all agree that you are in control. We thank you that nothing ever catches you by surprise. In fact, you have a plan from the beginning, and your plan is perfect. Help us to step back and see the big picture perspective. Help us see exactly what you are doing uh, in our world today, in our lives today, and where history, where our story is going. Help us to grasp not only the difficulties yet to come and to prepare for them, but help us to grasp the glories that are yet to come and maintain hope and persevere until that day. We can only do so by your grace. We can only do so as your Holy Spirit enables us and empowers our witness. And we pray these things in